Okay, so this next video is about standard errors. And I, I briefly mentioned standard errors a couple of times during the descriptive uh, statistics session. Um, people usually put standard errors on graphs, just like they put standard deviations on graphs. And if you ask them, sometimes they don't even know what they put on there. But standard errors are not covered in the descriptive statistics section. So standard errors are actually an entirely different beast, and it's a big deal. I would say standard errors are to statistics what um, discovering the law of gravity by Newton was to astronomy at the time. So with the law of gravity, all of a sudden you could predict the path of planets and the path of moons. Uh, so all of a sudden everything made sense. And the discovery of the formula for standard errors in statistics was a similar moment. So this enables all of classical statistics. So we'll talk about what they are and also a related concept of confidence interval. So those are essentially the same thing. So we're going back to the example uh, of repeated sampling that we uh, had before. So we have our eco region with uh, different types of trees and we want to know what the means of certain attributes of those trees are, maybe wood quality, maybe growth rates. So we could imagine that a study is done by one scientist and you get a particular result and then somebody else disagrees and looks at this again where we can think about, just as we have in the previous video, of 10,000 scientists doing this random sampling and calculating the means. And we would find that depending on how many samples they take, there are different degrees of certainty. So we could infer that from those distribution of means. So if, if a set of scientists were just going with five samples, those means could vary quite substantially. If they took 50 samples, uh, they would probably be getting closer results, closer to the uh, true population mean. Uh, and as you increase your sample size, your certainty would increase. And that level of certainty, that is what we want to quantify, right? So we want to, we want to know how sure can we be. But we don't really know that unless we actually repeat the experiments and see what happens, right? So how, how are these means distributed? That uncertainty is, is unknown to us. So that's why repeating research is essential in science, and it allows us to quantify the uncertainty. So if we get widely varying results from uh, different investigators, we can't be so certain. Uh, if they all get very similar results, then we confidently can make decisions. For example, to select one species for reforestation rather than another for a commercial forestry operation. Now. What if we could just estimate the uncertainty rather than actually do the study again and again? So if, if we could pull this off, so if we can skip all those repeats of uh, the 10,000 scientists so that we get the distributions of our uh, means to quantify uncertainty, what if we could just estimate those from a single sample? So if, if one person could say, um, this is my sample and, and I can deduct actually the distribution of the means. So that's the big breakthrough. That's the big uh, deal in statistics. So if we can do that, we not only get a mean, but we also get a measure of uncertainty with it. So if we could find a, a law of nature for uncertainty, that would be really cool. You know, that would be a big breakthrough. And um, so I said in the beginning, it's equivalent to the discovery of the law of gravity by Newton. And so one of the interesting things is that, um, you know, all those big discoveries of natural laws, those are basically done by people guessing. <laughs> so if you think about it, so the, the way physicists usually do this is they, they just draw a line here, nominator and denominator, and then everything that's positively correlated with something they put there in the nominator, and everything that's negatively correlated uh, they put in the denominator. And so based on observations of uh, the path of planets and, and moons, Newton figured that out already, so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a function of mass, so the gravity is bigger the bigger the masses are, and also the distance plays a role, so the bigger the distance, the smaller your effects of gravity. So that, that's a general principle, but you never be quite sure how they look like. So uh, you can try out different things. You can add the masses, you can multiply them. Uh, sometimes you have to square certain things. So it turned out the uh, law of gravity is this one here, uh, plus a constant, because you know if your masses are in one unit, your distance is in another human-made unit, and your gravity is in yet another unit, uh, you, you need some sort of uh, constant to make the units match up. Um, but this turned out right, 
So you can just guess it and test it against um, actual data, see if it works. And we could do the same thing for the natural law for uncertainty. So what we want to know is what is the distribution of uh, my means? So let's measure this in standard deviations of, of my means and repeated sampling. Um, so what do you think um, contributes positively to the size of the standard deviation and what contributes negatively to the size of the standard deviation? And you can test it. So you can collect some data with the CLT uh, a tool that I showed you in the last video. And you can, or you can just program it in R and see if it works out. So you can create a normal distribution where you know what the, what the mean and standard deviation is. You sample it and see if your formula that you dream up based on this principle, so what do you think is positively related and what do you think is negatively related, see if it works. So if you'd like to try that, pause this video and uh, see if you can be as smart as uh, Newton. Um, so my thinking would go as follows. I, I would put the uh, standard deviation of the original um, population in the denominator, because the wider that is, the wider the population of my means is probably going to be. And I would put the sample size here that we picked, uh, I would put that in the uh, denominator. So the bigger the sample size, the closer uh, those means will be together and the narrower that distribution of sample means uh, will be. So that, that would be a guess and uh, it's actually not quite right. So it is actually the standard deviation squared uh, or the variance, or that's actually the same as the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. Uh, so that's one of the same thing. And we can test it in R. Uh, let's try this. So the code should be looking pretty familiar. We do the same thing as we've done uh, multiple times now. Uh, we create a normal distribution with uh, 10,000 trees, standard deviation of 3, and a height of 15. Um, so let's take a look. Uh, there it is, uh, mean of 15, standard deviation about 3. And um, let's take a sample size of 9 because that makes the math uh, real easy. So the expected standard error, if, if our formula is right, that would be uh, the standard deviation divided by the square root of 9. Um, so 3 divided by 3 is 1. Um, I do want to keep track of my sample means, so I start here with an empty vector. And uh, let's start sampling with sample size equals 9. Um, so there's my sample from that population. And um, let's calculate the first mean, 14.7, a little bit below, but that's expected. And I'm going to add this sample to my sample means. Um, so if I run this procedure again here, um, that's my second one, 14. And uh, another one, 14, so I seem to be consistently slightly below. Um, there, now I'm above. And I'm just going to run this a couple of times. Could obviously put this in a loop, but uh, it's nice to be transparent and see what's actually happening. So now we get a little bit more variation here. And uh, usually I do this with a class, so everybody calculates a standard error, and then we uh, sum them all up and uh, look at the distribution. So maybe that's enough. Um, so we could just now look at the distribution of my sample means. And it is 1.13, so close to 1. So this is what we want. So this formula does work. So we discovered a natural law of uh, how to quantify uncertainty. And, uh, you know, of course, this would require a little bit further testing. And um, you can actually mathematically derive this as well, this particular one. But you can guess it. So it's a, it's a very intuitive formula. And it's in a way beautiful that this very simple formula describes those natural processes that we've um, discovered in the previous video, driven by the central limit theorem uh, in such a beautiful and simple way. So this is really amazing, just like the law of gravity, you know, why can it be that simple? 
Um, anyway, uh, let's talk about confidence intervals as well. So those are very similar uh, to standard errors. If we take a mean and a standard error from the R simulation that we just did, uh, maybe this particular mean was pretty close, and then we have a, a standard error estimate that's a little too high, so we expect 15 and 1, but you know, there will always be some random deviation. I can plot this out in my histogram of my uh, means uh, in multiple runs. Um, as, as the mean of 1502 here, and then I add one standard error to get to the mean plus one standard error, I add another 1.13 to get to the mean plus two standard errors, and I subtract uh, to get to the other numbers here. So this is a histogram with original units uh, of my sample means. If I talk about one uh, standard deviation above a mean of zero or two standard deviations, uh, that's also called a z-score if I talk about sample means. And if my sample size is small, uh, they're actually t-distributed, so this is also the same as your t-value. So a t-value of 1 means that your uh, particular observation of, say, 16.15 is just exactly one standard deviation above the mean. Uh, so those are my z-scores or t-values. And then I can also calculate percentiles uh, of this distribution. I start with a percentile of 0 uh, for my minimum value and 100% for my maximum value. And I can ask what's the percentage of my observations within a certain area of the graph. And we already talked about it before, so standard deviations behave in such a way that 68.27% are within one standard deviation. So plus minus one standard error, that's also equivalent to a 68% confidence interval. So 68% of my means would fall within plus minus one standard error if I repeatedly sampled my population. And if I wanted to uh, calculate a 95% confidence interval, uh, we talked about this before, it's not exactly two standard deviations. Uh, so two standard deviations is 95.4 something percent, 4 5 percent, there it is. Uh, if I want an interval where exactly 95% of my means fall within those two values, it's a little less than two standard deviations, uh, so 1.96. So, um, that is what the standard error is. Um, so the formal definition of the standard error is if I were to repeat an experiment over and over and over, each time taking a sample and calculating statistics, then 68.27% of the values of my statistics, for example means, would fall within plus minus one standard deviation. And there's also kind of a reverse reasoning. So there's a 68% chance that the true mean falls within one standard error. So the true population mean is in a black box, right? So we don't know that. But we know that the distribution of the uh, sample means will center around this mean here, right? And we also estimated the width of that distribution. That's our standard error. Uh, so now what we can do is we can calculate the probability that uh, that standard error or confidence interval captures this true mean. So if I add a multiplier to this, uh, according to my percentiles, I can make a statement that there is a 95% chance that the true means falls within plus minus uh, 1.96 times the standard error. So let's uh, check in R if the system works. So classically, what you would do is, uh, if you want a particular confidence interval, you have to look up um, the percentile and for a particular z-score. So what we want, we want 95% of our sample means being between two values uh, at the two ends of that normal distribution. So 95% is between the 2.5th percentile and the 97.5th percentile. So those are the two values that you would have to look up in a table. You find these tables uh, at the appendix of any statistical textbook, but we can also uh, just query them in R. So there's a built-in functions that give us those values. So Q norm for, so that's a quantile on, on a normal distribution for 0 0.25. That is minus 1.96 standard deviations below the mean of zero, right? So that's a set score. Um, so it goes from minus 1.96 to plus 1.96. So if we look at the other end, it's symmetrical. Um, that gives me the same value positively. Now, if my sample size is small, so in our previous simulations we used a sample size of 9. Um, my degree of freedom is 9 minus 1. So I can look that same thing up in a table for t-values. Uh, so that's a qt function. Now let's try this. Minus 
2.3 to plus 2.3. And that makes sense because uh, those T distributions are a little wider, a little fatter tails. So those values have to be a little larger to capture the 95%. So let's see if this actually works. Um, we can generate our standard population of 10,000 trees with a mean of 15 and a standard deviation of 3. And I'm going to sample this. Um, nine samples, just as we've done this before. Calculate the mean. Now this time we calculate the uh, standard error based on the sample. And let's look at our mean, 15. Oh, that's pretty darn close. And uh, our standard error is 1. Oh, pretty darn close. So, wow, that's pretty good. And now I can calculate my confidence interval by multiplying the standard error times this factor here that I uh, figured out. So plus and minus the standard error times 2.3. And let's see. So the statement that I would make is there's a 95% chance that the true mean of the population is within this confidence interval here from 12.6 to 7.5. So I was right about that. And maybe I got lucky this first time because I really got very accurate estimates of my population parameters. So let's do this again. So this time we're still right. The true population mean falls within this interval. And um, let's run this a couple more times. Um, I'm right again here. 12 and 18. Yes, I got it. I, uh, 12 and 15.3. Close, but I still got that right. Um, between 12 and 17. Um, 14 and 17. I'm good. Uh, so I'm not making any mistakes here, right? So I make the statement that that's the interval where my true population mean sits. I'm right again. I'm right again. This time I'm wrong. So this time my estimate was that the true population mean falls within 15 and 18. And so this can happen. And I can communicate exactly the probability with which my statements are wrong. So in this case, with a 95% confidence interval, I'm 5% wrong. Um, but that's good. Uh, that's fine. We can set any confidence interval. So if something really important would depend on my on my estimate, I could set that confidence interval to 99.99. So I can now make statements with associated uncertainties. So that's a big deal about statistics. So if you do that right, those are very powerful statements that you can act on with the desired level of confidence, or you can support decision makers who need to uh, make those decisions.